Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Valves and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 103, we're going to continue our series on how to achieve great sound, part three, cables. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. In part two of how cables can affect your sound, we're going to look at one key measurement of a cable, the capacitance. So Charles, can you show us what capacitance is? Okay, so whenever we're talking about capacitance, you think capacitor. And here's a great example of one that we have here. This is a typical Nichicon. 470 UF filter cap that we like to use in our kits. And here's an example of a small silver micro, mica 100 picofarad uh, trimmer capacitor. So what is a capacitor and how does it work? Let's go through it quickly here because we don't have a lot of time. A capacitor is made whenever you have two different conductors running parallel to each other and separated by a dielectric or insulating material. A capacitor like this guy will look something like this on the inside, where you have the two electric conductors running parallel in a long swirl to get lots of surface area, because that affects our actual capacitance. So what else has two conductors running in parallel? Well, cables do. And we've got a demonstration here to show you how different types of cables can have different capacitances. But first, let's take a quick look at this little guy right here. So if I clip that on, we can see that we have a capacitance of somewhere around 106 picofarads. Now this one is rated for 100, plus or minus 5%, but we're also getting some from the cables here, and it's hard to eliminate that even if we zero out the meter. And a, a picofarad is a very small value of measurement, right? It's, uh, what is it, a, a millionth of a microfarad? Uh, it takes a million picofarads to make one microfarad. Yeah, so it's a very, <laughs> very low value. So let's compare that to something like this, which is a twisted pair RCA cable, which has a conductor and a shield twisted together. Well, it's the ground path. Oh, the twist, ground path. Twisted yeah. with the signal. So if we hook that up, let's see what kind of capacitance we have on this guy. And this cable is about a meter and a third, four feet long. So it's quite a long cable. Quite a long cable. And when you look at that, we've got around 313 picofarads. So this cable has three times the capacitance of this little trimming capacitor right here. Okay, what's next? So after that, we've got a great example of the type of cable that we use in our kit amplifiers. This is our shielded signal cable, and what do we like to use this for? Well, whenever we're moving the signal around inside the amp, near a noisy part of the amp, uh, we'll put shielded cable in uh, instead of standard um, hookup wire. and. Um, I would say maybe about a half the time that we move the signal around, we do use shielded cable. Now this length is the same length, I think, or close to it as the RCA cable you just did. Right. Uh, somewhere around a meter or, or a meter and a, and a third. And take a look at the capacitance. So the other one was over, it was around 310, I believe, and we're at about 220 here. So we've seen a capacitance drop of about a third in just a different cable type. What if we go lower now? So if it's all based on surface area, then if we use a section of cable that's only a third of the length, we so, should see. So that's an identical cable to the one we just looked at. It's the same cable type. Just a third just a third of the length, right? And a third of the capacitance. Now we're only seeing roughly around 68 picofarads. Right. Okay, so that really illustrates how that works. Now what about a high quality, uh, low capacitance RCA cable? Well, we have one right here. 
So this is a Blue Jeans RCA cable, and this one is roughly, uh, I think this is a meter cable, isn't it? Uh, it's, it's a meter, so it's about 39 inches, so a little more than three feet. So let's see how capacitive this is, and this is their LC cable, isn't it? LC1, LC1. yeah. LC1. So it stands for low capacitance. So if we hook that up, oh, let's try and keep the clip on there. Take a look at that. So this wow. is roughly the same length as the other two cables that we were looking at. And look at the capacitance. We're only around 50 picofarads, so it's a huge difference. We're about four times less than the standard shielded cable and about six times less than the other RCA cable. Okay, so if we were to take away, we're going to do another episode at least on this subject because it's, it's huge. It really can make a difference in a system. But if we were to take away a couple of things uh, to pay attention with in your system, what would they be, Charles? Well, the length of the cables are extremely important. You want the cables to be sized for the purpose, and you don't want them to be any longer than they need to be. Right, and there are, like, there are uh, quality manufacturers out there that will make custom lengths. Yep. Blue Jeans is just one of them. Um, that we use good quality cable, good quality connectors. So length is important, and the quality of the cable is The important. quality of the cable is important. And if the manufacturer has paid attention to the capacitance of the cable, which Blue Jeans does. Right. And we just ordered in and resized um, some of the cables in our system. Now, the one thing that you should keep in mind is the capacitance is low. Even on the higher testing cables, that's still not a lot of capacitance, and it will depend on your equipment, right, as to right. how yep. it interacts with the circuit. It all depends on what you're connecting. In certain situations, it might affect something. In others, it might not make any difference at all. Yeah, so if you've got um, uh, a phono preamp, for example, and you're patching from that over to your preamp, that might be a cable you want to keep really short, um, even if its circuit is designed to handle cable length. The, a high capacitance cable probably would affect the EQ. Yep, and in some schematics you'll even see capacitors that are put in there specifically to trim those values and uh, make up for the capacitance of longer cable runs. Right. Well, thanks a lot, Charles, for doing that. So, what's been going on over at Melatone Kits? Well, lots, but I'm just going to give you the highlights. So, a few days ago, we finalized the GU50 monoblock design. And it sure looks like it's going to become a kit act, doesn't it? It looks like it's a winner. And what happened? You came in a couple of days ago, and I, I, had this, I had the latest revision done. I hadn't actually told you I'd done something, did I? No, but I could hear it. And we sat down and we listened. We did a short critical listening session, and I couldn't stop twitching. I just wanted to hear you say... <laughs> well, somehow it sounded even better than before. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I mean, this that is weird. As a designer, you're always striving to make things better. Uh, and when it happens, it's a surprise. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just... Anyways. Um, uh, so I always say when this, when we have a situation like that, when we take an amp that we're already really happy with, or a preamp that we're really happy with, and we move it up one more level, I always say don't touch anything. <laughs> don't that's, touch anything. That's no. it. The design is finalized. So I'm happily building away the second uh, mono block so that we can do some critical listening. Hopefully by next week, maybe the week after, we'll have some listening notes, and we'll do a whole episode on it with the specs and the sweeps. Okay, um, so what came in this week? Uh, well, a whole bunch of my favorite power tubes came in. Let's look at this one here first. Everybody knows that this is the Svetlana 6550C, the real vintage dude, and I got a lot in, and I have at least one, maybe two, quads that are just, they're close match quads, but they're just testing a little low. I'm going to put them in the store um, heavily discounted. So you'll see them with a discount um, tag beside the inventory number. So if anybody has ever wanted to try these and you're on it, this is for people on a tight budget. Um, after you put your discount code in, you should be, I don't know if it'll be as low as half price, but it'll be a good deal anyways. What else came in? Uh, oh yeah, a whole bunch of my favorite EL34s. 
Have a look at these. Mother XF2 series were made from about 1960 to 72. There's nothing like them. Phillips that owned Mullard um, basically invented the yellow 34. Later on, they, they uh, a few years later, they developed a small version of the yellow 34 called the yellow 84. Both much loved tubes. And right away, you're going to notice the boxes are all different. The, but these are new old stock, new in the box, but they come from remaining inventory, which is getting harder and harder to find. This is by far the most expensive quad I sell. Um, I make up maybe two, maybe three new old stock, new in the box quads a year. And that means that I have to have maybe 30 or 40 of these tubes in stock to do that. So that's one of the reasons why they're so darn expensive. It's not an easy tube to match. No. It's not, and it's getting harder and harder. But it's for me, it's almost fun. So, um, but look at the boxes. Sylvania never, of course, made um, a Mullard. Uh, Phillips, well, Phillips owned Mullard, so that's not surprising that they would be rebranded Phillips. Siemens never made a Mullard EO34, but they're a high quality company, so not surprising they'd want to have this tube to sell. And Mini Watt Dario, what was Dario, Charles? Well, we talked about that last week, but that was actually a brand that Philips owned in France. Right. So this is basically a Philips rebranding of their own tube. Exactly. <laughs> right. Okay, well, let's... Oh, thank you. <laughs> let's open up... Well, let's open up the Siemens box. Um, just take a quick look at what a brand new Muller DL34, the real McCoy, looks like. So... Check your domes. They should be pure, full chrome. That's a good indication that the vacuum's intact. Have a look and see what getter you've got. You really don't want to mix up getters. This is the large single halo getter. There is a twin version. The tubes are virtually identical except for the getters. The double getter has less chrome on top, and that's about it. They sound exactly the same. You'll see some factory codes, and you, they're so faint, they're, they're etched. Uh, and there'll be an XF2, that's the series, and a capital B for Blackburn, and then the date code. I doubt if you can see it on camera. Look at the base. Is it pristine? And how about the pins? Everything here looks very much new old stock, brand new. Okay, so I've, I've made up, I think I now have two of these in store, which is unusual. If you've got the dollars, this is going to be the ultimate EL34 quad that you'll ever own. And if you buy them new old stock and you take care of them, hopefully they'll last your lifetime. Maybe even your relative's lifetime. Anyways, let's not think about those things. Okay, well, if you stay to the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember we've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world. And if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. Stay safe, everyone. Have fun. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.